Hey guys. Manila, the heart of the Philippines, is longing to have you back. We search for your wandering gaze inside our museums and your curious steps through our historical streets. We look for your merry smiles as you eat and shop, and your laughter is a sound we long to hear once more. Hopefully soon, the city of Manila misses you. As the world awakens from the slumber brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, we eagerly prepare for your return, launching projects that highlight safety, cleanliness, and most of all, the beauty that the city inherently exudes. Our dream is to welcome you to a Manila that has spent much time in heightening its existing tourist experience. To give our visitors a visual access to the rich art and cultural heritage of the city, street clearing has been actively pursued. A pedestrian-friendly city awaits as wider sidewalks and green spaces are being built alongside enlivened parks and greenways. Tourism events are continuously launched with a kickoff of the Restaurant Week, which aims to give emphasis to the gastronomical adventure when one visits Manila, as it boasts of a diverse palette brought about by the various cultures residing in the city. From the authentic Chinese food in Binondo to the street food of Ubo and Endaya, and just recently, within Bonifacio Shrine, beside the newly installed Berlin Wall, is the newly launched Cafe Tolio, a coffee haven. All these are being achieved while the city adheres to the health and safety protocols that have been set by the World Health Organization. Face masks and face shields must be worn at all times, while protective health habits such as proper hand washing, the use of sanitizing alcohol, and social distancing are strictly followed. Manila is a beautiful home enveloped with the warmth of its people, teeming with palpable pride, unforgettable hospitality, and resilience through any form of adversity. This strength, witnessed by its long and colorful history, pushed us to rise with courage, faith, and hope. Even in the midst of a challenging economic period, Manila is ready. See you soon. In the, last In the last 500 years, Filipinos have fought for freedom, unity, and equality. We have made our mark in many fields, from science and medicine to culture and the arts. We are beacons of creativity, resourcefulness, resiliency, and compassion. In 2021, the Filipino people will join the world in commemorating one of the greatest achievements of mankind. The first circumnavigation of the world. We celebrate this historic achievement by bannering an important message. Over adversity and struggles, we shall triumph. Putting humanity first. Always. Not 
Bisitahin natin ang Manila Damang kapanatagan at pagmamahala Ito ay bahagi ng aming tanging yaman Sa lugar na sagana, sa kultura at kasaysaya Bahagi ng kasaysayan ng mundo sa Pilipinas Sayag na sa ibang bayan To klasin ang kasaysayan Sadyang nakakahalina Sa lugar na makuli Welcome po sa Manila Tuloy po kayo magalak sa aming hinanda Sa pagdating sa lugungin Ang ganda ng Manila Sarili lang pakisama't bayanihan Subukan nating isulong at ligawan ang Magandang bukas, ikaw at ako magkasama tayo Sa lubungin ang kinabukasan
Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, before we start, uh, let us first give reverence to the flag as we sing the Philippine National Anthem together. So welcome everyone to the fourth episode of the Araw ng Manila Lecture Series. Now this episode is extra special because due to the name of the lecture series, today is finally Manila Day or Araw ng Manila. This webinar, of course, is brought to you by the City of Manila, by the National Quincentennial Committee, by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, as well as the Intramuros Administration with the support of the Department of Education, the Department of Foreign Affairs, the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, and of course, this is your host, Rancho Arstilia, from the Intramuros Administration. And as we go through the session, please be reminded that questions and comments are welcome, so they are encouraged. So if you are viewing via Zoom, there's a chat button below or a Q&A button below the screen. Feel free to pin your questions or if you are viewing via Facebook Live right now, you can also key in your questions in the comment section below. And then later we can go through them during the open forum. 
Now to introduce the speaker. So for this uh, fourth episode of the Aron of Manila series, we have Dr. Jose Victor Torres. He is a multi-awarded writer, Palanca award-winning playwright and essayist. He has an MA and a PhD in history from the University of Santo Tomas. He is currently a full professor at the De La Salle University where he's also the Associate Director for Drama and History at its uh, Bienvenido and Santos Creative Writing Center. As a former researcher for the Intermodal Administration, his book, Ciudad Morada, won the National Book Award for Travel Writing in 2006. And in 2017, his, essay, his collection of essays, To the Person Sitting in Darkness and Other Footnotes in Philippine History, was awarded the National Book Award for Essays in English. He is the author and editor of books on Philippine history and culture and a contributor of articles on history and culture to local magazines and uh, journals. All right, so uh, without further ado, I would now like to call on Dr. Victor Torres for his presentation. Sir? Hi, Rancho. Good morning. And magandang uh, umaga po sa ating lahat na ngayon is na nag-attend nag ngayon itong uh, webinar na ito. Uh, before we start the uh, webinar, no, I'd like to um, request the audience to uh, devote a, a moment of silence okay, for <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> eh, the passing of our um, former president, uh, Benigno Aquino III, and additional prayers and blessings for our newly installed Archbishop of Manila, Cardinal at been pula. Let us hope that um, this 40th, uh, the 40, 450th celebration of um, of the foundation of the city of Manila shall be a, it is already a historic one because of the events that are happening. But uh, hopefully it would be just more than, um, than sad or happy events or religious events, but it should also be a, an event of learning or being part of um, the historic events that will be happening today in the, for the um, history of uh, the founding of uh, Manila. Okay. Uh, before I start, I will um, open my slide uh, presentation for all of you. Okay. I'd like to, uh, while I'm doing this, I'd like to thank uh, the National Centennial Commission and the uh, Commerce Administration and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and other related agencies who made this webinar possible. Okay, I hope that uh, we can all see the uh, slide, uh, the slide now, the color green in background, okay? Now, uh, before uh, before I start, you know, um, I'd like to ask the audience you know, to imagine Manila or imagine the history of Manila. I don't want this uh, webinar to be just a lecture of facts, a list of facts and a list of events and so on and so forth, but I'd like the audience to enjoy this webinar because we are trying to look at the uh, history of Manila now from a very different point of view. You have been treated to a lot of um, to a lot of facts, to a lot of caring, to a lot of opinions uh, as provided by our uh, uh, other speakers who have uh, who have gone to the you know, the uh, this uh, webinar. You know, the, uh, mine is the fourth, no, and we'll have probably the last one in the afternoon with my colleague and. Um, one of my favorite historians, the Dr. Ambeta Ocampo. My lecture today is about the history of Manila, but looking at it at a very different angle. The title of my lecture is Manila, the Rise of Ciudad Murada from Lumang, Manila. It is a history of Manila, but I am going to try to at least clear up some confusing notions some unknown facts and other um, trivia that you may have encountered in the history of Manila. Okay? Today, we celebrate the 450 years of the founding of the capital city of the Philippines. 
It has been more than 450 years of the story of a city on whose beginnings encompasses the story of an entire nation. What do I mean by this? Look into your history textbooks. And in the first chapters of the Spanish colonial era, you would see that everything is focused on Manila. No? Um, the economy, the Galleon trade, so on and so forth. This, this, were, this, were, um, this came from uh, much of this, this came from the city of Manila. It was only much, much later, you know, at least more than 100 years later, that the um, religious and eco economic and other cultural um, influences and expansions would happen all over the Philippines. But at the start of everything, everything was focused on Manila. As I said here, as I say here, one only has to look into the text of every history textbook through the years in order to realize that, that the beginnings, or what I call the embryo, of our colonial history begins with Manila. For Manila was the center of the Spanish colonial system, not only in the Philippines, but of the Spanish Empire in Asia. So, knowing the story of Manila means knowing the beginnings of our national history. Narrating Manila, telling the history of our past. What you see in that picture is uh, Intramuros in 1935. It, uh, of course, there were already airplanes at the time, and uh, you can see the city as it continuously modernized while retaining its old look. You can see the uh, golf course, the, the areas that were clean. You can see Fort Santiago at the bottom of the picture. And of course, the wide expanse of the Pasig River. Now, the best way to tell history is tell its story. Cuento. Tama na sa skwela natin yung mga memorization ng facts. Ula-ula, you can't you can get a story by just memorizing uh, memorizing uh, names, by just memorizing um, um, dates by just memorizing um, places, but you have to put them all together in order to see the story. Sikat na sikat sa atin ngayon yung mga Korean drama, no? o kaya yung mga trese sa, 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 uh, ano tayo dito, sa animation and everything. But if you look at it in a way, no? but, and you, the, all the Korean dramas are only given to you in names. Of places, you think you will have a story. So what am I saying here? We have to look beyond our history as a list of facts. We have to look at our history as a story. Cuento. And in order to do this, you ask, you have to ask yourself why and how. And look at the trivia. Look at the small things. Now, a word about trivia. Trivia is not bad. Because trivia attracts listeners. It is the spice of historical narration. But, as I say here, narrators must be careful in using it. Hindi pwedeng lahat ay trivia na. Ayaw, walang mangyayari sa buhay natin. Pag pala ay trivia lang lahat. No? They must not divert their listeners or readers from the fact na may substance yung kinikwento o sinasabi ng nagre-recite o yung nagkikwento o yung nagsusulat. Dahil kahit may trivia, kailangan ang sinasabi nila ay ang katotohanan sa ating kasaysayan. Kaya ang isang mabuting kwento ng kasaysayan ay ipaghalo ang general history sa trivia. Mga mabalilit na kwento lamang, pambuhay ng interest sa mga taong uh, nakikilig o nagbabasa ng kasaysayan. So simulan natin ang kwento ng Maynila. The Manila of yesterday, the first topic is the Manila of yesterday years, or what, or leading to the Manila of today. Intramuros was the Manila during the Spanish period. Pag sinabi mong Manila o Manila nung palahon ng uh, Castilla at nung early part ng palahon ng Americano, Manila only meant one thing, Intramuros. Yung ibang areas ng palahon ng Castilla, ang tawag nila dyan, Arabales. Yung Sampalok, Tondo, Binondo, San Nicolas, Pandakan, Paco, Santa Ala, 
Permita Malate, Quiapo, and Santa Cruz, ito yung mga modern districts ngayon ng City of Manila. Pero nung ulang palahon, Arabales ang mga tawag dito. Parang mga town provinces ng siyudad. Ang siyudad mismo ay Intramuros. So the entire capital was within the walls of Intramuros. The city was, as you all know, sinasabi ito sa mga facts ng uh, Intramuros, the city was pentagonal in shape with a land area of 64 hectares beside the Pasig River in southern Manila. Can you imagine a capital city of an empire with a land area only of 64 hectares? Masasabi natin ito, kingdom, 64 hectares lang. Why? There were two Manilas during the Spanish period. Yung Ciudad de Manila, which was in Tramuros, was the capital. Yung Provincia de Manila was the Arabales or the outlying towns. Provincia de Manila extended as far as Rizal and um, para, um, south in Paranaque. Okay? Pero, nag-iba ang itsura ng capital city of Manila during the American period. Because when the American period uh, arrived, the Americans with all this grandiose idea of a new colony that they wanted to put together could not be satisfied with a capital city that is only 64 hectares. So what did they do? They now passed a law in which they created what they called the new city charter that would later create the new city of Manila with the boundaries very much extended. No, it is now about the boundary of Sampalo, okay, the boundary south of, uh, until the boundary of Pasay. Then, of course, east and west, no, leading, of course, east was uh, already, um, uh, sorry, yeah, east was heading towards Rizal, then, of course, west, there was uh, Manila Bay. Lumaka yung boundaries. What happened to Intramuros? Well, sad to say, Intramuros now became a capital city that was reduced to a mere district. Kaya ito yung, ano, ito yung uh, if you've uh, seen the play or read Portrait of an Artist as Filipino, kung saan niluluksa nung dalawang um, characters doon yung deterioration ng grandiosity of what was once in Tramuros. Okay, so, the capital city of Manila was in Tramuros at that time. Can you imagine an entire capital of an empire in the land area that was small yet ruling over islands in what is today parts of the Southeast Asian region? Because remember, the Spanish uh, missions, especially the Catholic missions, did not just include the Philippines. It included other areas as far as Vietnam, as far as um, um, Taiwan. Yet, these are all ruled over by a city and a capital that is only 64 hectares. Such an impossible thing to imagine, yet true. So, let's go to Lumang, Manila. Old Manila. I'm not talking about the Spanish. No, I'm talking about pre-colonial Manila. The original name of the native settlement was Maynila, hindi Maynilad, as it was commonly believed. Well, the, uh, I think the, uh, from my initial research that I already made, it seems that Maynila was, um, came from the, um, the uh, plant, no, of the mangrove plant that uh, uh, Ixara Manila, named by um, Father um, Manuel Blanco, and he mentions, of course, in his uh, Flora de Filipinas, that it was um, it was uh, the name that Manila was based on. No? Later researches by historians like Teodoro Agoncillo, who was also a Tagalog linguist, and writer um, Abe Cruz, I. Aguilar Cruz, pointed out that the nuances of the Tagalog language does not remove a cons the uh, last co uh, consonant when you want to uh, shorten or lengthen words. They do, they do not remove single letters. They usually move, move uh, syllables. So illogical yung Maynilad tapos 
all of a sudden magiging may nila na lang siya. Pero at ang karagdagang fact na sila nila, meron talagang nila. Nila was a plant that refer that uh, refers to a plant that was used to make indigo. That blue dye that is a um, part of the um, industry of the pre-colonial uh, Filipinos. And the uh, the area of uh, the settlement of Manila was a popular place for the selling of indigo. Kaya, ang naging pangalan niya ay May Nila. Nila also has another name. It was called Tayum. Which is, uh, you can hear the this name in other parts of the um, in the uh, Philippines where the indigo industry was um, was developed. But we also had a place within Manila. No? And this was, of course, the area we call now today Tayuman. Referring, of course, to Indigo. So remember, no? Manila, it is no longer Manilad. It has always, always been Manila. Manila was the center of a large market of foreign and local products. Most of these were from China and other Southeast Asian countries know, were, were traded. It was also the center of trade in Luzon at that time. Malaki Maynila nun. Um, just alo pala, alo, a bit of a background here. I'm using the, um, the painting Filipino Struggles to History by Carlos Botong Francisco. No, I'm using only the first part because the first part, as mentioned a while ago in our history, talks about Manila. But we are also talking about the entire history of the Philippines through some mural painting. But the first part, as I said, is the history of Manila. So you have Chinese drugs coming here. You have um, you have um, um, Indian uh, Indian uh, traders coming here, so on and so forth. You no, know? and of course the common marketplace for a for the Chinese traders, you know, where they would usually sell the products, was called a parian or a padian. Now, contrary to uh, to some belief that Parian was a Spanish word, it is not. It's a local Tagalog term. No? Parian. It even appears in our local Tagalog vocabularies. How big was Manila? In his research on the pre-colonial civilization of Manila, um, historian William Henry Scott said, the original Manila was from Fort Santiago until the area of what is today the pamantasan ng lungsod ng Maynila. Ang talong, was it pentagonal? No? At first, it was believed that it may have been pentagonal, no? but uh, in the early 1980s, the uh, UP Archaeological Society, no? uh, Archaeological Studies, sorry, headed by uh, Dr. Victor Paz, made some archaeological diggings in the river bank of the Pasig area, the Pasig River area. No? kung saan na uh, yung era ng, ng Puerta de Santa Isabel and of course where Letran is now. No? Um, unfortunately, after doing some uh, archaeological diggings in the area, they could not find any evidence that there was a civilization in that area. Meaning, mukhang, wala, mukhang walang itinayo doon. Mukhang hindi yung bahagi ng settlement. Why? Well, probably it was because it was quite the um, small islands of the river. And as we all know, this is also mentioned in the um, Spanish uh, religious chronicles. It's a swamp area. We have a picture of it. No, ito yung um, legendary um, painting lang old Intramuros from a uh, lid of a Mexican um, um, chest. No, yung baul. Nasa ilalim to ng cover. You can see on the lower right, the area of what is today uh, Letran is an island. No? And of course, you can see some small islands there along the Pasig River. It's on the right side. Ano? And of course, it would um, uh, be much later that uh, the area would be filled in and construction of churches and other structures will be done there. However, 
since it has been a swamp area before, it is the very same reason that until today, that area of Intramuros always floods. <clears throat> the rulers, of course, of Manila were, as we all know, Raja Soliman, who ruled over Manila. He was the nephew of Raja Ache, also known as Ladiang Matanda, who was the earlier ruler of Manila. So basically, when the Spaniards arrived, Manila had two rulers. No, Ladiang Matanda, or Raja Ache, and of course, the new ruler, Raja Soliman. That's why ang tawag kay Raja Soliman, Raja Mura. And um, Raja Ache was Raja Matanda. And of course, there was Sibunaw Lakandula, who was the ruler of Tondo. Okay? And all of them are related. That's one, that's one, that's one of the things. So, so it was one big dynasty ruling that area of Manila. When the Spaniards arrived in, uh, in the area, they were already uh, putting, uh, working on a settlement in Cebu, but uh, apparently um, the Gaspi would encounter, had a bad encounter with the Portuguese, of whom um, these Europeans were already making trade in the area of southern uh, Philippines, especially in the Visayas region. So, Legaspi eventually had to abandon Cebu, and he had to uh, move to a new settlement on Panay. It was on Panay that he would eventually hear reports of a very rich settlement no, in, northern, in the northern area of what is now uh, part of um, um, Luzon. And um, he got this report from many of the Chinese traders who were doing trade with Manila. So what did he do? He sent now his, um, his, uh, his uh, like a right-hand man or co commander of the expedition, Martin de Goiti, to go and inspect this so-called settlement, the, the word that was used was kingdom, you know, of which uh, was very rich from, he said, because of the centralization of trade. However, no, it will, this uh, inspection would cause now no, a massive upheaval in our history. The arrival of the Spaniards spelled the, the doom for Manila. What is seldom mentioned in Manila's history is that it was destroyed twice. First, by the attack of Martin de Goiti. Martin de Goiti had um, at least some good relations with the first two elders you know, of the uh, area, uh, Lakandula and of course Raja Matanda. It was Soliman who was suspicious. Now, namanghaba sila, namanghaba sila, sila Lakandula at sila um, Matanda, kaya no, sa Martin de Goiti. I think hindi sila na mangha, no? Because uh, it was believed that they were probably already doing trade with some Europeans. Remember, no? The area was already being visited by the Portuguese. But this um, suspicions, of course, of uh, uh, Soliman would eventually come to, uh, come to a disastrous end when um, it was during their um, stay in the area of uh, in the area of uh, Manila, you know, that a um, cannon shot, which was a signal for a greeting for the Spaniards, was mistaken by Soliman for a attack, and he proceeded now to attack the Spanish, the Spaniards, you know, and eventually the Spanish uh, soldiers retaliated. And destroyed um, Manila. Okay. What happened next, of course, was that um, the Goiti would have easily taken over the area, but he knew that he only had several men with him. He eventually abandoned the place, returned to Palay Island, and reported the matter to Legaspi. Legaspi was hearted by the news and realized, of course, that maybe Manila was more was a more secure place to uh, to have than Cebu or Panay. And eventually, he uh, moved down the uh, colony, or his planned colony, to 
Manila. Um, no, this happened mga at least uh, one or two years later. No, and when uh, they finally arrived there, Soliman, who had already rebuilt Manila, no, saw the arrival again of the Spaniards, you know, realizing, of course, that there might be uh, another um, conflict uh, that was going to happen. He burned the entire settlement and fled to Tondo to his relative uh, Banao Lakanduna. Eventually, uh, Legaspi, who had always played a quote-unquote diplomatic role as a Spanish conquistador, managed to enter into settlements no, with the three rulers of Manila. But the the um the objectives of the Spaniards of colonizing the Philippines was eventually um revealed by um by their actions no? and um there was of course uh, later resistance no? by what we uh, what has been known in our history as the unknown warrior of uh Makabebe in Pampanga. I'm not going to talk about the um the uh, unknown uh, warrior, you know, because this has been a um, very well done research work by uh, NHCP, uh, NHCP researcher uh, Ian Alfonso, and um, it has uh, gained a large uh, following, you no, know, that led to the putting up of a monument to the uh, warrior of the first resistance against um, Spanish rule. But of course, until uh, today, there is still some uh, research is trying to be being done. For one thing, we really have to know who is the real Because we, we encountered a lot of names. Uh, there was, of course, the Tariq Suleiman, of which um, later my later research would prove that it was a fake name by uh, Pedro Paterno. So um, it is still very much uh, debate what was his real name. Okay. We all know the story. As provided by uh, the earlier lectures by um, um, Mr. Alfonso and, of course, later by uh, Shao Chua. No? And uh, the, uh, warrior, the warrior laid down his challenge for the Spaniards no? by saying that let us meet and fight at the Bangkusai Channel. Now, here was a problem. Where was Bangkusai? When I wrote the um, when I wrote the uh, research work though know, for to identify the uh, to uh, to prove that uh, the the Tariq Suleiman character was uh, faked by Pedro Paterno, I looked at the uh, text of the uh, challenge that was laid down by the um, warrior. No, may the sun part my body in the middle, and may I be disgraced in the eyes of my women. Who would detest me if any time I will be a friend of the Spaniards? Then he would jump out of the window and say that he is expecting them at the mouth of the Banco Sai Channel. My problem here was that I had looked at several old maps. I probably haven't seen any everything. I could not find Banco Sai Channel. In the uh, more detailed map of uh, Father Jose Alge, you can see here the areas of Navotas, Bulacan, and Manila. Now, Manila is on the southern part. Then you have Navotas here. Then you have the Bulacan, and of course, the areas of uh, Pampanga on the upper left. Okay. Ondo is the one near the yellow, um, almost at the bottom. Okay. Now, here was the problem. There is no Bangkusai mentioned here. Ayan. Navotas is there. No, you can see Malabon, and you can see the channels no, that crossed into um, the areas of Tondo. Yet there is no Bangkosai, and this is the uh, water part. They will do uh, what um, the water part of uh, Tondo. My uh, theory was that uh, Bangkosai was probably a part of the um, the Barra de Vitas. Which is of course the opening of the um, the opening of the uh, Navotas, what is now the Navo part of the Navotas Malabon River. So how did the name disappear? I don't know. Yet. No. 
I would I would uh, like to probably think that it was probably a condemned place that um that eventually uh, the Spaniards uh, would move to eradicate its name. But here's a uh, here's a uh, interesting thing, no? There was a street before named Bangkusai in Tondo. It is mentioned in uh, street maps as part of Tondo. But as a as a as a river, uh, a waterway, or part of the river, it's not mentioned at all. Unless probably there will be an existing document that will pop up. Uh, and even today, the street called Bangkusai is no longer ex in existence. It is now called uh, F Barola Street. Although recently the NECP placed a uh, marker in the area to commemorate the Battle of uh, Bangkusai. Now, founding Manila, and uh, this is still part of the uh, the painting no, of um, Carlos Botong Francisco. Um, we have always read in our history books that Manila had been founded by uh, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. But the question is, how, what was the ceremony like? We have always seen in the in um, TV, a lot of TV uh, movies or movies you know, that's showing the uh, when Christopher Columbus uh, landed in uh, South America, he would uh, they would put up a cross, they would read a scroll and said, "I hereby name this uh, area San Salvador as um, in, in honor of uh, the uh, Lord uh, the, the Savior Jesus Christ." The question is, was there a prescribed ritual for the foundation of a city. That question would remain hanging or would that be noticed no? until in the 19, um, until in the uh, early 1980s when the Augustinian researcher of the Intramuros administration, uh, Father uh, Jesus uh, Merino, uh, Father Luis Merino, no? would uh, would have discovered a document that was the prescription as provided by the Council of Indies for the foundation of city. It is. And there was a ritual, surprisingly. Now, here's this description as uh, provided. The commander of the colonizers would select a spot and had a hole dug deep for a tree trunk to be buried in and leave a protruding section around 1 to 1.4 to 1.2 meters high. It is then lowered into the hole with the help of the natives. Then the commander, in this case, if this is Manila, it would be Legaspi, will drive a knife into the trunk and turn to his audience, you know, composed of natives, of course, and the Spanish colonists, and announce in a loud voice, gentlemen, soldiers, and comrades, and all others who witnessed this, here I set gallows and sword. And found and placed, you know, using an example, the city of Manila, because it was a basic formula, which may God keep long years, reserving the right to move it to any other site that might prove more convenient. In this city I caused to be in the name of the king, and in his name I will defend it and will maintain peace and justice with all the Spaniards, conquistadores, citizens, residents, and strangers, with all the natives meting justice alike to the rich, to the poor, to the lowly, to the high, and protecting the widows and orphans. Mahaba pa yan. No? The commander then would draw his sword and made a wide clearing of the people. Di ba? Siga pa siya noon. And uh, as he shouted the challenge, if there be any here who would challenge this, let him come forward and out with me to the open field, challenge of two well, no? where I will measure my sword with his. And this I swear for I intend to die defending this city, now or whenever, keeping it for the king my lord and his captain, servant, and subject, and as a gentleman born. And he would recite this three times. And if there is no challenge, the uh, colonists of the Spaniards would respond that the city is well founded, Long live the king and our lord. Of course, siyempre, pang maintindihan ng mga natives, oh, baka tanong nila, umasiraon, umakato. No, but uh, there was a uh, translator who translated for them. No, 
Now, um, I've always um, wondered about this um, translator, no, who would translate for the natives, uh, because um, who would translate for them? Unless this formula would come later, when communication has been well established among uh, the natives and the Spaniards. After reciting the ritual, the commander then slashed at the surrounding plants, saying that he is placing the city under the authority of the audiencia or the governor, and that he is making it its capital. A sword is then planted on the site of the plant church. The mass is said by the priest. The ceremony is then with the, uh, is ended with a salvo from the canons and declaration. Celebration. Now, look carefully at the, um, the description uh, that he is placing the city under the authority of the audiencia. This has always been the uh, contention or debate no, among the, um, the questionable dates of the founding of the city of Manila. It has been established that it was June 24, you know, because at that time, the audiencia or the city government was already existing. Now, and that is the basis for the June 24 date you know, of the creation of the city of Manila. And that, my friends, is the ritual for the finding of for the foundation of a city. Can you imagine that said in very classical Spanish? Were the natives uh, um, in awe with the power that is being portrayed here? Or would they just accept it as something part, as part of their uh, friendship with the Spaniards? The city of Padilla would continue. Would uh, be built no? and uh, would begin as the same features of the uh, Manila, Manila settlement, which is uh, a, um, a city surrounded by palisades, no? coconut trunks, and of course that had cannons and uh, lantakas no? provided by the natives. But it wasn't um, secure, especially in 1574. When the um, Chinese uh, corsair Lima Hong attacked the city of Manila and almost destroyed it before they were eventually driven off, the Spaniards were caught unprepared for it. But they already had a um, had a, an inkling of what would happen because the Chinese had already landed in Paranaque at that time. The problem that they had was that. There were no, there was not enough soldiers in the city because most of them were out in the provinces already exploring areas. Even Juan de Salcedo, who would eventually drive off the uh, Chinese from the Manila, Manila, uh, from the Manila capital, would arrive late and would eventually find the city almost destroyed before he managed to drive the Chinese away. There was one part of the story of the Limao attack. That is, um, that is mentioned in some of the chronicles, no? but uh, it came out quite prominently here in the uh, Botong mural. You can see it in the upper right side, upper left side. This was the death of Martin de Goiti. De Goiti was killed during the Lima Hong attack. Now, why? Uh, how did it happen? Uh, it was said that his house was located near the boundary of Manila, where PLM was. Edi siyempre, nung, nung sinugod na sila ng mga kasti, ng mga inchik, uh, he was among the first to die. Although he defended his, um, he defended his home quite uh, well, but he was already old at that time. He was already in his uh, 70s. And was eventually killed. Now, here was a curious thing. According to the uh, account, the Goiti's wife was there. No? And I've, uh, I've always um, been puzzled by it because in some accounts they said he was, uh, she was a Spaniard, no? asawa ni de Goiti. But um, I, I, I had to ask no, my um, colleague, Alberto Campo, uh, possibly na ba na mayroong colonist at that time, two years after the foundation of Manila? We do not know. Because it would take uh, one year and a half before the first galleon would sail and return with the first colonists. So, ibig sabihin, uh, 
yung first star galing that arrived before May galing na, before 1574, and that made the trip, and came back with the Goitis wife. The other possibility is that it was probably a native, a Filipino, yung asawa niya. No? What is known is that uh, after the Goitis was killed, his wife, uh, the description, of course, was Minolestia, but of course, we all know what happened. She may have been raped and uh, eventually killed by the uh, Chinese. The continuous threats of invasion and disasters would lead now to the realization by the Spaniards that they had to defend or make the city, which is the capital of the uh, the capital of the uh, their empire, secure. And this led now to the creation of what we know today as the Ciudad Morada or the World City. The description of uh, an American um, historian you know, during the 1930s would say, at this time, Manila was constantly open, not only by uh, to, not only um, attacks by Chinese and Japanese pirates, but by Portuguese forces, jealous of Spanish successes as a rival in Oriental trade, and by English uh, freebooters, this was already the 18th century, and were already right begin to prey upon Portuguese and merchant ships. But as early as the um, 17th century, there was uh, the late 16th century, there was already consideration if it is better to secure the city by building it in the only material that would make it secure, stone. And so the plan to build the walls would happen. Now, it would uh, definitely be a government project Spanish colonial government project after 20 years uh, after the foundation of Manila. Uh, but as early as the 1580s, there was already a plan to secure the city using stone. The walls of Intramuros were starting to be built in 1593. The stones that were used was adobe or volcanic tufa. This is common in the history of Intramuros, which were mined from Guadalupe. Makati. You can still see actually the uh, the hills of Guadalupe. That's made out of volcanic tufa. You know, if you cross the bridge, the Guadalupe Bridge in Edsa, where the San Carlos Seminary is, volcanic tufa yon. No, and of course, part of it was mined from uh, Bulacan. So by the 18th century, the city was surrounded by a wall, and as mentioned in the common histories of Intramuros, it would be known as Intramuros within the walls, and within those walls would the Spanish Empire develop? But what were the walls even before volcanic tufa was used? These were the early plans for Intramuros. And this is already, uh, Adobe was already being used here. This was Intramuros after the uh, some of the buildings in the uh, 18th century, 17th century. The idea of what would probably be the first structures of Intramuros in stone can be found in the southwest corner of Intramuros. And this was the circular structure that was found in the early 1980s and eventually became a project of the National Museum with the Intramuros administration. And this was a huge circular structure found inside. Baluarte de San Diego. What is curious about the structure was that it was well made. There were there were steps, there were doors, there were floorings. There probably was a second or third floor. Now, because what we have right now is only just part of the uh, ground floor. Now. The first uh, definite studies that were made about the structure was done by then I uh, Intramuros Administration Consultant, architect Isabel P. Cornell. The earlier guesses for the structure was that it was, it was a water cistern. But uh, architect Lilo would eventually um, submit a report about the structure saying, we are dealing with a structure that has undergone several phases of construction. 
this is still in the finish of the walls because the walls were made partly of brick and stone. And the lack of continuity in the architectural character of the building. Why is she saying this? It was because different materials were used. And the fact that apparently the materials that were used were not solid enough because apparently the, tower, the circular structure sank to the level where we know it today. Discounting the theories as, as to what it may have been converted into in later years, because as I said, it was later uh, determined that it might have been a water cistern. Our main interest lay in the original purpose of the building. As she narrated later in her report, my father, uh, the late uh, Pedro Picognel, who was also a, a friend of the Intermoose administration, a great uh, man and a great researcher, had a copy of the book Arquitectura Española en Filipinas by the uh, Spanish author, um, uh, Diaz Trachuelo. Okay. I was trying to figure out what the remains of the circular structure within Baluarte de San Diego were. My father suggested I refer to the book, which is, of course, the studies of the walls and fortifications of Intramuros. The book became invaluable. It provided me with background on the early stone structures in Intramuros and the effort by a Jesuit priest, Father Antonio Cedeño who was using and designing and using the fortifications for Intramuros by, and building them in stone. Okay. And it is mentioned in the document, in the um, Arquitectura, that years later, during the governorship of Don Santiago de Vera, the first stone fort in the city was erected. It was named Fort Nuestra Señora de Guía. The uh, documents that were found on Nuestra Señora de Guía gave several kinds of details, including the location of how close the structure was to the convent of the San Agustin Church and convent. What was more of a, also a jackpot was that the description or the plan included a sketch which showed a circular structure similar to the one found in the Baluarte de San Diego. Including the letters and the design, and of course, the cause of the fort by Santiago de Vera to the king. It was called for Nuestra Señora de Guía, uh, and this fort would appear later in several plans upon the, the construction of the walls of Intramuros. Apparently, Nuestra Señora de Guía was abandoned, yet it was incorporated when Baluarte de San Diego was built and designed, with design and later built. In fact, the structure could be seen in several photographs no, of uh, Baluarte de San Diego in the 1930s. Here's the structure, no? um, the uh, structure was already buried. No, and the, uh, a different uh, military structure was built on the uh, Baluarte de San Diego. And you can see it here. The, the flag is where uh, Nuestra Señora de Guía was. No? And it was only much later that it was uh, dug up. No? And now it is a tourist attraction in Intramuros. Histories and stories continue to abound in the narrative of our nation. And it is only in realizing these stories, whether it's trivia or not, and in seeing that these stories are linked to each other to give a bigger picture, can we see how our identities as Filipinos began and grew into what we are and what we may be in the future. From Lumang Manila to the Dad Murada, to Distrito, the district, the tourist district, to the tourist, prime tourist destination in the city of Manila. Thank you and Maligayang Karawan, Manila.
Maraming salamat po, sir. Thank you, Dr. Torres, for that very interesting presentation po. And I think this is, uh, I think the significant takeaway that we can get from this talk is that as we understand Manila, we also understand the history of the Philippines. And that as we immerse ourselves with the story of this city, we get a fuller and deeper understanding of our nationhood. It's quite interesting to have a webinar with special focus on pre-colonial Manila, especially considering that most of our popular discussions today are focused on the colonial period of the city. And in this webinar, we get a bigger picture of things because colonial Manila is discussed within the context of Lumang Manila. Thank you, sir. Now, everyone, we are opening our open forum. So we, uh, feel free to ask questions if you are viewing via Zoom. There's a Q&A and chat button below the screen. And if you are viewing via Facebook Live, we have the comment section. Just key in your questions or comments there. Feel free to raise any concerns, any questions. If you have any point for clarification, please do, so that we can raise them on air in this uh, webinar. Uh, sir, uh, thank you, sir, for uh, discussing the overview of the colonial Manila. And uh, just uh, to start the question portion of uh, this webinar. Most literature today would refer to Manila as a kingdom. Of course, this is just a matter of translation. But do you think this translation is accurate? Uh, yeah, I've always um, considered that. That's why you notice I, always, I keep saying settlement only when I'm referring to Manila. No? But um, um, probably it was a kingdom, but because of our classic um, understanding no, of uh, of a ruler, of a datu, of a raha, so on and so forth. No, we are always trying to um, to uh, relate it to something grandiose. I'm not, I'm not maligning or minamalit ko na ay kaya lang naman na Manila, no. But uh, if you look careful, if you look at almost all of our doc, our uh, historical sources, no, it is always mentioned as a settlement. No, probably because it may or may not have been that permanent. No, but uh, well, riverine, riverine settlements were permanent because it's the source of livelihood of a lot of um, the old uh, areas. No, but 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 the one that I definitely saw as considered as a kingdom, not a settlement, was the Mayan, which is now uh, the Mayan in Tondo, not Manila. No, uh, Tondo was considered like a, a kingdom probably because of its size and its population. And even the old kingdom of Anamayan, which is now Santa Ana. No? But I seldom saw Manila referred to as a kingdom. No? Probably because um, um, I'd like to think of it as a, probably a satellite of the bigger kingdoms. No? But eventually, this uh, small kingdom of uh, Manila would eventually end up as the, prime, the premier um, capital, the, the site of the premier capital of the uh, city. Now, uh, considering that the uh, demonym uh, Manileño is modern in Spanish, what do you think did the original residents or citizens call themselves? Tagalogs. They call themselves Tagalogs. Tagalogs. Okay. Hmm. Thank you, sir. Uh, you mentioned earlier that Manila became Manila and would eventually become Intramuros. Now, do we have data on when the term Intramuros first came into use? Uh, actually, transitions into names are not easily determined. You know? But definitely, we could say that the word Intramuros began when, when uh, the walls were already up. You know? uh, but the transition from Manila to Manila is uh, very vague. You know? Because uh, if you look at the later, um, some of the Spanish documents, of, uh, of the era, some of the Spaniards were, were still using Manila. But eventually, many of them would, go, would uh, use uh, Manila, They're removing now the Y, and some would eventually also use Manila, double L. But eventually, um, I think that uh, because of this evolution of what the city would be called, eventually it became um, stuck not to the word Talagas, Manila. Now, 
because we all know that the uh, native uh, name was May Maynila. I think the importance of using also the uh, the native uh, the old the old name became part of our um, formation of nationalism. Uh, that it was, of course, Maynila, but we aren't referring to the settlement anymore. We are referring to the entire city, no, which uh, minala siguro sila na di-retain yung pangalan ng Manila, di, ilang kinalate, di, Maynila, sa atin pa rin yan. How about, sir, the term intramuros? Uh, when did it first came into use? I think intramuros came about when the walls were finished. And the uh, decentralization of power eventually would happen. No, uh, because it's kind of hard to say in Tramuros without a wall. No, <laughs> because you say you say we did the walls. No, but I think uh, it was more or less um, used when uh, I have no definite date for it. I would be glad if I could see a document that would uh, that would officially name no in Tramuros. Uh, but uh, what I always saw was Manila. No. Um, that would eventually um, change that. I don't think the, the name was changed into Intramuros. I think for me, Intramuros was more of a, uh, like a colloquial term or a descriptive term lang. No? Kasi um, Ciudad Murada, they don't officially call Manila Ciudad Murada. No? Uh, they call it Manila pa rin. No? So, um, I, I seldom see documents made by Spanish uh, Spanish uh, documents where it is mentioned as Intramuros. It is usually Manila that is mentioned. No? Um, salamat, sir. We have a question from Arnold uh, Adraneda. So, from Arnold, ano po ang naging relasyon political, economical, at social ng Manila sa mga karatig na lugar? Paano ito nakapag-ambag sa pagkabuo ng mga lugar bilang komunidad o lipuna? Oh, as I said uh, in my lecture, no, and of course it's written in the histories of uh, Manila, Intramuros was the center. Eh. It was the center of religious power. It was the center of economic power. It was, um, it was the center of education. Every student who wanted to have higher education goes to Manila. No? Yung mga secondary schools, medyo, medyo uh, um, lumaki lang konti because uh, they started putting up secondary schools in the uh, provinces. But the university was still located in Manila. So every student who wanted to be um, to attain a uh, higher education would go to Manila in order to become part. Oh, just to give you an example, so if you look at all the if you look at the lists of the um, the delegates of the Malolos Congress, no? you would be you would be you would be quite uh, shocked that most of them were graduates from the University of Santo Tomas no? in Manila. No? So it means that uh, more or less these people became quote unquote Manileños because they took a presidency in Manila. To study now that's for education. What about trade? Um, before the opening of the Philippines to world trade, where the uh, ports, international ports, were created now in uh, Pangasinan, in Iloilo, no, in, in, in other areas, everything was centered on Manila. So from Manila, it became now the distribution point to the local provinces. No. Now, how did it relate to uh, how did it relate to the uh, the population? Well, um, the the population wasn't alone. Um, was um, what, what can I, how can I describe it? So the population, of course, of, uh, in relation to the urban life, was determined also by the economic uh, stature because of the work that was available, you know, and of course the uh, education that was available. To these uh, people, the the uh, questionable narrative that the Spanish school, that the schools that were put up, you know, uh, like the University of Santo Tomas, were severely limited to uh, to uh, non non Filipinos. That was that's ridiculous. 
Because if uh, if it was only just limited to Spaniards, then the university would have closed down because there, there was very few Spaniards at that time no? who would uh, become educated. Most of them are studying it abroad. So who would, uh, who would the uh, university and schools cater to? They would cater to Filipinos. Okay. Now about religion. Well, uh, Manila was the center of religion. You know, there's no denial about that. Okay. But then again, um, it, everything that emanated, missionary work, uh, cultural work by uh, religious emanated from Manila. So, ang ganda lang, malaki ang relasyon talaga ng Maynila. Kasi, everything at that time, unfortunately, and fortunately, unfortunately, was centralized in the city. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question from... Now, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi can be considered a divisive figure because he can either be seen as a colonizer or as a founder. Now, we have a question from, from Lexi Reyes. Should we offer reefs to Legaspi in recognition of his uh, founding of the city? What are your thoughts on this? I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. Because he did found the city. Thank you, sir. So, now, if, if you can probably locate the tomb of Rao Soliman, you can probably, uh, <laughs> you can probably uh, also lay a reef there. Hmm. Huh? But in this case, uh, uh, Legaspi was the founder of the city. No? Here is, here is uh, probably one of the things uh, that you, you should remember. Our history is a colonial history. You cannot remove that. If you want to remove anything that is colonial about it, you know, transform every stone church in the Philippines into a nipahat. Because those are colonial remnants. No? Remove everything that is colonial in your Cuisine, because most of our cuisine today was affected by the Galen trade, which is a colonial trade. So, if your problem, I'm sorry to be uh, to be like Mataro or something, no, but if your problem is laying a writ to a Spanish uh, founder of the city, it's fine with me. But we also lay writs in uh, Jose Rizal. Even the Spaniards lay writs on, even the Spaniards lay. Uh, they are on Jose Rizal's monument. I don't think they were condemned for that. Thank you, sir. So, the, sir, do we have uh, non-Spanish sources on the founding of Manila? There was already a significant number of Chinese traders in the area during that time. Are there any written sources from the Chinese? Uh, we have. Uh, we, uh, that's uh, that's, un uh, that's uh, unfortunately, you know, that's one of the... Um, for many, no, unless you you can read Chinese, that's a very rich source of uh, of uh, the history of uh, Manila. The Chinese sources, another rich source of uh, the, or probably that needs to be researched on, is the Portuguese archives, uh, because the Portuguese were in contact with the Visayans and the uh, and uh, the Filipinos, the early Filipinos, even before the arrival of the Spaniards. So what we, we have to be surprised, we should be uh, probably surprised on what can be found there. The Chinese, yeah, it had a lot. There mga histories talaga. And I think, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Bahai ba 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 Chinoy already had a catalog on the, the sources that I uh, would mention uh, Spanish and uh, uh, Chinese uh, sources on Manila and, uh, and other areas of the uh, Philippines where the Chinese trade and the Chinese relations would happen. Thank you, sir. How about, sir, the uh, imperial archives of the Ming Dynasty? Was there any effort of going to there for by like, previous researchers? Sorry, uh, what, what archives? The archives of the Ming Dynasty, sir, in Beijing. May not be effort. Probably there is. So I like the, um, what uh, like historians like uh, me would encourage talaga researchers to go there to uh, to co conduct research and conduct not only conduct research there, but to maintain contacts with scholars from those countries. No, uh, my colleague in the De La Salle University, uh, Dr. Uh, Fernando Santiago, 
Kasi right now, doing the um, a uh, study, of course, on the, the Malay identity with the uh, fellow Indonesian scholars. Asian to, not exactly foreign, foreign, but of course Asian. But determining, of course, the Malay identity for, for the Southeast Asian region. So yeah, I, uh, if you're interested, probably, you know, the, um, hopefully when the pandemic ends, uh, that uh, we could easily manage to uh, travel abroad, there are scholarships always available in yes. which our, they, um, archives would eventually be open to. It was uh, earlier mentioned that there was a very elaborate ceremony involved in the founding of the city of Manila. Now, do we have any information on the most probable place where the tree trunk was buried during these rites? Uh, um, I'm sorry, but uh, no, I, I don't know the other. I don't know if, uh, if uh, there is a definite place. No? Probably, um, I could guess, uh, this is only speculative, but it was probably uh, will put, be put up where the center of the city would probably be. No? And if we look at the center of the city, it will probably be the area where the Manila Cathedral is now. No? Now, uh, the, the, that is also a point of clarification because we have always said that the, um, that the cross of the Manila Cathedral points to the center of the city. Of Manila, diba? What was being referred to as the center of the city of Manila here was in Traburos at that time, not that not the entire city of Manila. Because hmm. no? if you try to do that, you will not land in the center of the city. You will, you will just land on the one side of the city. No? Hmm. So with the cross, you know, the Manila Cathedral, that I don't think that is still be considered today, um, were uh, pinpointed, of course, the center of the City, which was in trouble uh, Considering, sir, that the reference material presented earlier on the ceremony was only a prescription, do we have any record that the ceremony actually took place? Uh, that, um, considering the fact that it was written, no? and uh, probably um, considering the fact it was an official, you know, official uh, document uh, that was found by Father Merino. Father Merino's um, um, theory was that it was the prescription for almost all of the cities. Not only in the Philippines, but probably in the other cities that were founded by the um, Spaniards, not only in Asia, but also in Latin America. Thank you, sir. We have a question from Raul de la Rosa. So aside from the reason for the construction of the walls, the stone walls of Intramuros, how important was the Limahong raids in the development of the city? Well, uh, the, the Limahong uh, attack was actually one, was just one incident of many that would, um, that would uh, be encountered by uh, the city of Manila. The attacks from foreign invaders were very few and spaced. Although they didn't come every day, but uh, the um, when the walls were being built, no, um, fortifications were of course um, built to protect the walls from whatever attack that may come. But also included with the construction of the fortifications were buildings, because the number one enemy of uh, Intramuros at that time was fire. Not the you know, uh, well, if the fire comes with the enemy, they, they must grab it. You know? uh, they can easily set the city on fire. But uh, the number one enemy of fighting Moros at that time was uh, fire. So attacks came later, especially when the galleon trade was in full, you know, was in full um, force. You know? People knew my in colony because of the galleon trade. Okay, it was attracting um, foreign invaders. Thank you, sir. Now, in episode number two of the Aron of Manila lecture series, we had Chao Chua, and in his uh, presentation, he mentioned that uh, when the Spaniards occupied Manila, the original citizens, the original residents of the city transferred to another place we now call Rizal Park, and it was the reason why it was called Bagong Bayan, meaning new town. 
Now, do we have any sources for that? Or is that just um, a theory? I'm, I, I'm, I'm not uh, sure where I saw that, but I, I, know, I know of that a lot, that the reason why it was called Bagong Bayan, it is because this is where the, uh, the residents of, uh, all the residents of Manila would eventually transfer. I cannot, uh, I cannot remember the source at the moment. No? But that was the reason why it was called Bagong Bayan, because it was a new town that was going to be eventually put up for the old, old, uh, the old, the, the, the natives, so the natives of Manila, who were forced to, um, to leave when the, the Spaniards began constructing the walled city. And unfortunately, uh, Bagumbayan would uh, not uh, last very long because uh, it would eventually be demolished during the British invasion. Also. The end, of course, the, uh, the, the demolition of Bagumbayan would eventually lead to the dispersion now of the um, native population or the Filipino population of the area. Thank you, sir. And now, uh, we now end our open forum, but before we end this question and answer portion, sir, it's a Pong Pong Miss Universe a question. What is your message to the city of Manila this 458 years, uh, year of their foundation? Um, I have always enjoyed the city of Manila. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I grew up in Manila. Um, I used to live in Blumen Creek. No? And uh, before I, uh, my, my parents uh, moved out and we moved to Quezon City. However, um, my, I spent my college years here and my work years here. I, 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 was, an, I was an employee of the Intramuros administration for almost 20 years. And I'm teaching here in Manila. No, uh, I'm teaching in Manila. I teach at the De La Salle University. And I have seen the continuous, um, let me say, deterioration and development, both at the same time, of the, uh, of the city. But what I would like to um, continuously see, especially in the local government, and I'm probably calling this because my, my cousin is the assistant of uh, Papa Isco, okay? <laughs> He's a uh, former councillor. Um, let, let's circle, it's my cousin. Um, probably what, something that we should really value, and I'm, and I'm sure that uh, is, uh, Mayor Isco is doing this, the value of not only preserving our heritage, but preserving a way of life that is adjusting to the modernization of the city that would make us say that we are proud to be Manileño. No, no matter if you go home to Quezon City, no matter if you uh, uh, if you just work in uh, in Manila, you will be proud to say, no, it is fun to be, no, I'm proud to be Manila. Thank you, sir. Now uh, that concludes our fourth episode of the Araw ng Manila series. Now to promote our next and final episode. This afternoon at 1 p.m., we are having Ambeto Campo of the Ateneo de Manila University History Department. So this is to conclude our Arono Manila lecture series. So this talk will be about Manila in the past tense. So see you later in the final episode of the Arono Manila lecture series. Now, thank you so much for Dr. Victor Torres. And thank you, everyone. Rabi so see you po, mamayang hapon, and mabuhay po ang Maynila.